Welcome to this video on spectrum slicing. So this topic fits into numerical methods for eigenvalue problems. And we have already seen in previous videos that you can do the power method, which will give the dominant eigenvalue. And you can do variants of the power method and also the QR algorithm. And what we have also seen in those videos is that for symmetric matrices, we often have nicer properties. So the power method will converge faster. Um, the upper Hessenberg matrix in the QR algorithm will be tridiagonal. And in this video, we will look at a method that works a bit differently. So what it tries to do is for a symmetric real matrix, find intervals that contain an eigenvalue and we will shrink the size of those intervals if you want to have an accurate um, approximation of a certain eigenvalue. So the context is we will look at symmetric matrices and we will describe a method that can find any of the eigenvalues. And there are a couple of ingredients for this numerical method. So let's have a look here because they're listed on um, the slide. So we will look at Cauchy's interlacing theorem. And what that is, is that it gives a relation. It tells us something about the eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix, plus the eigenvalues of basically the top left boxes. So we're going to do submatrices of say a symmetric matrix A, and we will look at the top bit, which is one by one, two by two, three by three, and so on. And we will find a relation between the eigenvalues of those submatrices and the original matrix. Then we will also look at Sturm sequences, which is basically the characteristic polynomials of those submatrices and a list of them. And bisection, and probably you already know what that is, that is a zero for functions, for nonlinear functions. And combining those, we will find a numerical method to find eigenvalues. So that is a bit of an outline for this video and a couple of videos afterwards. So I will sketch the algorithm in this video. I will present some results and the proofs or the understanding why this all works and how this fits together will be elaborated in a couple of future videos. So first of all, let's look at the context. So what we will do is develop a method that finds one or more eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix. And just so you remember, if you have a symmetric matrix, we already know that all the eigenvalues will be real. And our method has a couple of basis ingredients that we will use. So Cauchy interlacing theorem is one of them. Sturm sequences, I will tell what they are in a second, are one of them and bisection. And in a future video, we will prove the Cauchy interlacing theorem. So I will state the theorem in this video, but I will give the proof in a next video because that takes up a bit of time. And that is based on the courant fischer minmax theorem, which is basically a characterization for eigenvalues. But that will be the topic of a future video, but this is a bit of an outline into the topic. So let's look at an example here. So I have a matrix which is symmetric. So as you see, what, what I just did here is that I took the numbers one, two, three, four. I put them on the main diagonal. I want to have a symmetric matrix. So I labeled five, six, seven. Copy them because it needs to be symmetric here in the first column and then eight, nine and ten and so on. So just an example of a matrix. And now what I want to show you is that First, the leading principal submatrices are these. So this A1 here, that's just the top left one by one block. And A2 here is if you take the top left two by two block. And then A3 here is the top left three by three block. And A4, that's the original matrix back because the original matrix was by four by four. And what I'm going to show you now is that there is a relation between the eigenvalues of these sub matrices. So in general, AJ, it is called a leading principal sub matrix, and it's just a J times J upper left block of the matrix. Now here's a little MATLAB script where I define this matrix. And what I do here is that I let J go from one to four, and then this B matrix here is going to be A1, A2, 
a3, a4 during the loop. I let modlog compute the eigenvalues using the built-in EIG routine for eigenvalue that modlog has. That probably uses the QR algorithm, but that's not important here. And what I'm going to plot is I'm going to plot the eigenvalues at different heights. So that means that we can see all the eigenvalues um, immediately. And I plot them all together. So what you get here is a plot and this red cross here that is the eigenvalue of this matrix. Well, that's just one because it's a one by one matrix. A2 has two eigenvalues. All of these matrices are symmetric, so all the eigenvalues are real. And these yellow crosses are the eigenvalues of A2 here. Then A3 has three eigenvalues. So this matrix has these three purple crosses as its eigenvalues. And a4 has these four eigenvalues. So the height in the graph is just to separate the eigenvalues because they're all real. They're all on the real axis. If you would all plot them on the real axis, then what you see happening here is that this red cross is in between the two yellow ones. Similarly, this yellow X is in between these two purple ones and this one in between these two purple ones. And then this one, that's a bit hard to see, but it's in between these two green axes. This one is in between these two, and this one is in between these two. And that is called the interlacing property. So if you look at these submatrices and compute the eigenvalues, then if you take two of them, two consecutive ones, then the eigenvalues are in between. And this property is called the Cauchy interlacing theorem. So let's see how you can formulate that. So the same setup as we had on the previous slide. I have a symmetric n by n matrix. Aj is the jth order leading principle submatrix. So just a j times j upper left block of the matrix. And then what it says is the eigenvalues of Aj interlace the eigenvalues of Aj plus 1. So they are located in between those eigenvalues. To make that a bit more clear, say that AJ has the eigenvalues lambda superscript J subscript K. So K runs from 1 to J, and the superscript indicates which, which block we're talking about. Um, let's say that we, we order them like this. We know they are real, so we can order them. Then if you look at K plus 1 and K, then the eigenvalues um, are located in between. So this is the J by J matrix that has J eigenvalues. This is the J plus one times J plus one uh, block matrix. And those eigenvalues of the J matrix are located between those of the J plus one matrix. To make it maybe even more clear, hopefully, um, the top left number, the one entry, is a one by one matrix that has one eigenvalue, precisely that entry. Then the two by two in green here has two eigenvalues, and those two are located to the left and right of this red eigenvalue. The green ones are in between the black ones, like this. And then finally, the black ones are in between the blue ones. So that's what the interlacing theorem tells us. And we will need that for our numerical method. I am going to prove it, but not in this video, because that's going to take me more time. So I'm going to do that in a separate video. Next ingredient for our method are storm sequences. So what is a storm sequence? Well, if you define the polynomials pay j lambda as the characteristic polynomial of the aj matrices, and then it will turn out to be convenient to also introduce P0 and just make that one. So that is just for convenience later on. I am going to use a recurrence relation. So I'm going to express pay PJ in terms of its predecessors, PJ minus one and PJ minus two. And then it's convenient when we can have a P0 here. Now, a storm sequence is 
as in this theorem. So we are going to pick a number, a real number, and we are going to evaluate all of these p polynomials in this number. So what this is going to be is a list of numbers. Okay? And the first one apparently is going to be one, and the other one depend on the matrix. So we get a list of numbers here, and then what this theorem tells us, it's a bit of a strange theorem, um, you should count the number of sign agreements. So you have a list of numbers here, and they are positive or negative, or zero. And if you go from plus to plus, that's a sign agreement. If you switch from plus to minus to plus, then you do not have any sign agreements. Plus 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 is two sign agreements. So you count the number of sign agreements in this sequence, and then apparently this number, as mu, is the number of eigenvalues that our matrix has that are located to the right of mu. So I am going to give you an example in a second, and later on in a future video, I will also show why this holds. But for now, let's assume this holds true. And this gives us some information about the location of the eigenvalues, because I can pick real numbers. So if you visualize the real axis, you pick some number there, say zero, you compute the storm sequence, and then you have information how many eigenvalues are located to the right and how many eigenvalues to the left of zero. And then you could also pick 10 or 100, and then you can get a global impression of how the eigenvalues are distributed on the real axis. So where the eigenvalues are on the real axis. And that is going to be the key ingredient to our algorithm. Um, and then just if you would encounter a zero, that's a bit of a special case when you talk about sign agreements, because what is the sign of zero? Um, then we will assume a sign change. So it has opposite sign from the previous one. And then we have assigned a sign to zero, and we should stick to that. So if you have a longer sequence, if there is a number to the right of zero, then you should just keep the same choice for the sign. So let's look at a little example here. So I'm going to look at not too big a matrix because I have to do this by hand. Normally, of course, you would do it on a computer in MATLAB or any other programming language. But let's look at um, an example matrix. So I am going to consider the matrix A. It has to be symmetric. And I pick this one. 1, 1, 0, 0 for the first line. 1, 0, 1, 0 for the second row. 0, 1, 2, 1. And the last row, 0, 0, 1, minus 1. So as you see, it is symmetric, it's even tridiagonal, it has a bunch of zeros in there. The question I would like to answer now using Sturm's theorem is how many positive eigenvalues does A have? So how many positive eigenvalues? So what I'm going to do is form the Sturm sequence for mu equals zero, because then the theorem tells us how many um, eigenvalues are located to the right of mu equals zero. So that's the positive eigenvalues. So what I have to do now is compute the Sturm sequence. So I have to find P0 in mu, P1 in mu, P2 in mu, P3 in mu, and finally P4, and that's the whole matrix, in mu. So I have to form the characteristic polynomial and then evaluate that at 0. So P0 of mu in general was defined as 1. P1 of mu, well, that's the determinant of 1 minus lambda because 1 is just this top left number in the matrix. So that is just 1 minus lambda. So P1 at 
zero. If I plug in lambda equals zero, then I find one. P2 of mu, that's the first one that gets a little bit interesting. So I have to look at this two by two top left block and then subtract lambda from the diagonal. So what we get is one minus lambda, one, one minus lambda. And for a two by two matrix, of course, you know what you get there. So we have lambda squared minus lambda minus one. And we see that P2, if I plug in zero, I find minus one. Let's do one more. So P3 of mu. So I have to look at the three by three top left block, which is um, what I marked here. So what we get is the determinant of one minus lambda one zero, one minus lambda one zero one two minus lambda. So pausing for a second with the computations, what you already see here is that this is a lot of work. So we would like to have a more efficient, faster way of computing such a storm sequence. And we will also discuss that in a future video. And the way we get there is that you know that for a determinant, say this determinant of this three by three matrix, you know that you can express it in a smaller determinant using development along a row or column. So um, basically using the definition of determinant. And then you could express it into this determinant, but this determinant is precisely our P2. So that is also how we can get from a larger matrix to sub matrices. And we will see later that we can find a recurrence relation for PJ in terms of its predecessors. But for now, let's just do the computation. So if you compute this and let me immediately write down the result because I'm sure you can do that. This is going to be minus lambda to the power three plus three lambda squared minus three. Oh, I am sorry, I put mu here all the time, but of course this should be lambda. Sorry about that because it's the uh, characteristic polynomial lambda, lambda, lambda. Lambda, that's better. And then we see that P3 of zero equals minus three. Now for the fourth one, that's a bunch of work. So I'm going to be a bit lazy and I'm going to give you the result because I already did that on a bit of scrap paper and PV, P4 zero equals four. So now we have all the numbers in the Sturm sequence. Let's write them on the next page. So what we have now is that the storm sequence so it is p0 at 0, p1 at 0 up to p4 at 0 and we have just found them to be 1 1 minus 1 minus 3 and 4. In other words, we have plus plus minus minus plus. And then if you count the sign agreement, so here we go from plus to plus, that's a sign agreement. Then we go from plus to minus, that's not a sign agreement. And here is another one from minus to minus. So we have two sign agreements. So the conclusion is that S of zero, so S was the number of sign agreements for zero equals 
2. And what Storm's theorem tells us is that there are two eigenvalues larger than zero. So two positive eigenvalues. So what we have if we order them is that lambda one is bigger equal lambda two, which is bigger than zero, which is bigger equal lambda three, which is bigger equal lambda four. Because we have a four by four matrix, we have four eigenvalues, lambda one up to lambda four. And if you would compute them, you would indeed find this to be true. So you could check that in MATLAB here. You can also do it by hand and you will see that indeed there are two positive eigenvalues. Okay, so that's hopefully makes a bit clear how this Sturm property holds. So the Sturm sequence and then the number of sign agreements gives us some information on the location of the eigenvalues. Now, before I can formulate the numerical method to approximate the eigenvalues, I need one more ingredient, which is bisection. And bisection, you have probably seen in a previous course, uh, like introduction to numerical analysis or something similar. So what it is, is a zero finder. So given some function f, we try to locate alpha such that all f alpha equals zero. So where does the graph of the function intersect the horizontal axis for which x values is f of x zero? So here's a little plot. And what you see here is that here is a zero of the function. So alpha is a zero of the function. That just means that f of alpha equals zero. And as you know, sometimes that's a very easy problem. So if you have the graph of a... Uh, a straight line, then you can simply find it like this. If you have a parabola, then you have the ABC formula. But sometimes it's also harder. So even for a simple function like this, 2 times x times e to the power x minus 1, you will not be able to find an analytical formula for the zero, but you can still do numerical approximation. And bisection is one of those methods. So what you do in bisection is that you try to locate an interval AB, such that the function is negative at one endpoint and positive at the other one. So here in the graph, you see that the function is negative at A and it's positive at B. And then if your function is continuous, so that's an assumption we will make, then it has to cross the axis, the axis somewhere. So that's alpha here. So by construction, the zero alpha is located in the interval. And then the idea is really simple. We look in the middle. If it is positive there, like it is here, we just shift the endpoint, the right endpoint, the B, we shift it to M, and then we have reduced the size of the interval. So if F of M is bigger than zero, as we have in the graph, then we take a new B, which is equal to M. If we would have found that that's not the graph here, that the function is negative, then we shift the other endpoint, we shift A. If by coincidence, F of M would equal zero, then you have found the zero of the function and you're done. So what we have now done is, is cut the interval in, in two pieces and now we have a smaller interval that still contains the zero and we just repeat the procedure. So again, we take the middle and we shrink, shrink, shrink until the interval is so small, the interval length is so small that we have a good approximation for our zero. So that's the idea of bisection, very simple. So just as an example, if you have a parabola x squared minus three, then you can easily find that alpha equals square root of three is one of the zeros. If you do that, approximate that with bisection, we know this from the calculator or MATLAB or whatever, you can find easily an interval, say from zero to two. In zero, the function is negative. In two, it is positive. So this is a suitable interval. And indeed, of course, 1.73 fits in zero too. And then if you do this bisection algorithm, you start with 0, 2, and then the middle is 1. You find the function to be negative there. So what we do is we shift A. Then the new midpoint between 1 and 2 is 1.5, and so on. 
So if you look here, you see that the distance between A and B gets smaller and smaller. It, it's halved in every iteration step. If you look at the midpoints of those intervals, you see that they slowly converge towards 1.73. And you also see that the function values, they slowly go to zero. So that's bisection for you. Now, how can we use that? So now let, let's put the puzzle a little bit together. We've got several pieces now. So what I want to do is use this storm theorem and combine it with bisection to locate eigenvalues. So I'm going to pick some number mu. I'm going to consider the storm sequence. I count the number of sign agreements. And now what I know is that S of mu is the number of eigenvalues that are bigger than mu. So if you can find, and this is where we move to the bisection part, if we can find numbers A and B such that S A is larger equal I and S B is smaller than I, then what this theorem tells me is that at least I of the eigenvalues are located to the right of A, um, and the less than I of the eigenvalues are located to the right of B. So what that means is that eigenvalue lambda i, so I've numbered them again, and i is the ith eigenvalue, so lambda i should be in this interval. And now I'm going to shrink the size of the interval to approximate lambda i. So what I do is I take the midpoint, and depending on sm, if it is larger equal i, I move a to the middle, and otherwise I move b to the middle. And that means that if I repeat this, I'm getting a shrinking interval, that still contains lambda i, so I can find an approximation of lambda i. So we found a new interval that still contains lambda i. And I'm going to repeat this procedure until the interval length is less or equal some epsilon, and epsilon is how accurate you would like the approximation for your eigenvalue to be. So let's wrap up this video. What we have seen is a method, at least, um, in, in, a, in a very crude form, so we're going to elaborate it further. But the basic method is there to find one or more of the eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix. And the way we do this is called spectrum slicing because the spectrum is the collection of all the eigenvalues and basically we cut it in pieces. Um, how we did that is using the leading principle submatrices, so just to J by J upper left block matrix says, and apparently there is a relation between the characteristic polynomials. And the way we located the eigenvalues is by counting sign agreements. So this wraps it up for this video, but we're not quite done because what I would like to do in a future video is prove this Cauchy interlacing theorem and also look further into the storm sequences and how we can compute them in an efficient way. But that will be the topic of future videos, so I hope you liked it, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.